Well, welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Liz Quintana. Um, I am a Senior Research Fellow for Futures and Technology for one day more. Uh, tomorrow I join Ofcom um, in the space sector, so I sh I'm sure I shall see you all again in a slightly different guise. Um, but for de today, um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you all um, to our second Assuring Access to Space uh, conference um, and to see a really nice mix of both space and um, uh, defence security professionals here because um, while um, the two aren't necessarily always seem to be very easy bedfellows, um, I think with um, the really rapid change that we're seeing in the space sector, there are some fantastic opportunities for um, defence security professionals, um, but also some um, uh, interesting roles and responsibilities that will fall out of some of this and um, uh, I told many of you before I attended the um, uh, space symposium in Colorado last year and I was struck how similar uh, we things were um, in the space sector now um, uh, it feels to how it was in cybersecurity about 10 years ago we've got massive opportunities um, in terms of uh, benefits it could bring to our economy and our way of life um, and indeed the way of life across the world but um, there will be some um, we need to assure that access to space and and secure it for the benefit of everybody so um, I'm sure this is not a topic that's going to go away um, anytime soon um, uh, so uh, good um, we've got our keynote speaker <laughs> uh, uh, just a few housekeeping notices from me. We're not expecting a fire alarm, so if you hear one today, please make your way down the steps, through the front door, um, and out along the street towards General Slim. Um, if um, that way is blocked for any reason, then uh, RUCI members of staff will um, escort you out another way. Um, we are going to abide by RUCI rules, which is that everything that's given during the presentation is on the record, and you can use it any time. Um, anything during Q&A is strictly off the record, and that includes social media, please. Um, I will be checking. Um, and um, I think that's everything else. Please feel free to come and see me or the team if you have any questions during the day. Um, and also, if you want to know some more information about RUCI, uh, we've got a table downstairs in the entrance. And I spent most of this year doing um, writing about implications of the new space age for defence security. So um, uh, there are some copies downstairs if you're not already RUCI members, or you could become RUCI members, and that would be lovely too. <laughs> Good, thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to Andy and Graham for our first presentation, thank you. I'm Andy Green, I'm President of UK Space and Chair of the, Co uh, the Space Leadership Council. Um, I've got a very simple job, which is to introduce Graham. Um, Graham is the CEO of the Space Agency. Um, having him talk to us about the new space environment implications of the UK is perfect. Personally, the thing I, th I find most impressive on his CV is the particle physics from PhD from Cambridge, but I'm sure that wasn't what he got his job for. He's a real expert on Europe, and at the moment that whole question about how our relationship uh, with Europe evolves is crucial, of course, for, uh, for the space industry, so it's great to have Graham in the chair. Over to you, Graham. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, right, well, good morning. Very good to be here. It's my first visit to Rusi, and I hope it'll be the first of many. Um, so, as Andy said, uh, I'm the Chief Executive of the UK Space Agency, um, and as I say, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and I hope I will learn something from uh, today's proceedings as well. Um, so, um, as I'm sure you know, the UK Space Agency is responsible for the civil side of the fence on the government's space agenda. Uh, created in 2010, our organisation consolidated 13 pots of space funding and dedicated resource from across government under one banner. We own the government's civil space policy and manage our European Space Agency and bilateral programmes. But we're also there to provide strategic leadership to the wider space community across the UK. The agency is a unique mix of arm's length delivery organisation, central government policy, uh, lead and standalone regulator. We have 130 staff today with a range of skills across the organisation to match our brief. My team manages everything from space science missions like Cassini, due to plunge into Saturn on Friday. I don't know if we've got a picture of it at some point. Um, uh, 
uh, due to plunging Saturn, as I say, on Friday uh, as its grand finale, to education and outreach intended to inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers. You may have heard of Tim Peake. Uh, but the line that separates the civil uses of space technology from the requirements of the defence and security community seems to be blurring uh, today. Um, the future of satellite mega constellations, the provision of high res satellite imagery, 5G connectivity, or live video streaming from space these are just a few of the areas that are increasingly dual use. We do have an overarching direction of travel for how both sides of the line will work together to help make space a key part of Britain's future. So the government's national space policy was published in 2015 and set out four interrelated policy priorities for government. First, the government recognises that space is of strategic importance to the UK because of the values that space programmes deliver back to public services, national security, science, innovation and the economy more generally. Second, the government commits to preserving and promoting the safety and security of the unique space environment, free from interference. Third, it supports the growth of a robust and competitive commercial space sector underpinned by excellent academic research. And finally, the government commits to cooperating internationally to create the legal frameworks for the responsible use of space and to collaborating with other nations to deliver maximum benefit from the UK investment in space. The UK has a history of playing to its strengths. Our investment in space over the course of the last 30 years has built on the areas where we can be sure of a strong scientific or economic return to investment, in particular in telecommunications technologies and Earth observation satellites. But the last 10 years have seen areas of new growth that will create the opportunities for tomorrow. So what does the future look like for the UK and space? Well, I believe the question of our time is increasingly how we define our relationship vis-a-vis -vis new space. As we grow and test the limits of our lean and agile government approach to space, uh, we are playing our part in defining the future relationships between commercial and institutional space activity. We are doing our part to kickstart the UK's commercial space community through our Launch UK programme considering the opportunities to establish operational spaceports in the UK and leading the way in Europe towards both spaceflight and satellite launch services. Also, getting the UK regulatory environment right, which is a topic that we'll come to later in the morning, will be a key challenge as the market moves quickly, creating new launch opportunities, developing commercial applications and services, as well as innovative technologies. And the Space Industry Bill, currently on its way through Parliament, provides a framework to begin launch services from the UK, to build on our strengths in small satellite technology and satellite services, and to give certainty and clarity to new space businesses that wish to operate from the UK. New technologies, including robotics, in which the UK has great strengths, in-orbit refueling and repair, will create a more congested environment around our planet, increasing the need for debris management and tracking solutions the need for a clearer regulatory framework that manages our regulatory requirements while managing the ambitions of the commercial space sector to drive economic growth will require a delicate balance. I also cannot talk about the future of the UK space sector without considering the impact of our departure from the European Union. Many of you will have seen the publication of the government's discussion paper on foreign policy defence and development yesterday, a timely publication given to today's event. Space played a central role in that document, which I believe was an acknowledgement of how well we have worked together um, with our colleagues in the defence community to, um, uh, to create and articulate the benefits and challenges of our spared, uh, shared space capability. I do not sp believe space would have featured so prominently in such a paper had it been published ten years ago. Our defence and security capabilities are tied closely with our European partners and we rely on access to space and satellite data for our security and prosperity. UK expertise and capabilities have been instrumental in developing the security and effectiveness of both Copernicus and Galileo and they have in turn provided opportunities for UK and European com companies to develop innovative spa security critical space technologies. Given Galileo's application security and the extent of the UK's involvement, we will need to consider all options, as the paper yesterday pointed out, when discussing future cooperation in space. 
Space technology underpins our ability to act in concert and our defence sectors are closely integrated with our European partners. It is the government's position that the EU and UK should explore how British and European industry can continue to work together to deliver the capabilities that we need to counter the shared threats that we face. We believe that this would draw on the UK's cutting-edge technical expertise and space R&D facilities and ensure that we are holding the common ground with our allies. But the opportunities and challenges of Brexit notwithstanding, space is a fundamental part of Britain's future. Satellite technology connects our country's infrastructure and creates a safer, more secure environment for our citizens. Space is closely aligned with the government's industrial strategy, positioning satellite technology and services to play a key role in the strategic challenges facing our economy. Together with the UK space industry, and in particular with Andy, who's leading the effort from the industry perspective, we are working towards a space sector deal. This will mean continued investment in science and technology, a new regulatory environment, and developing regional space clusters, supporting a stronger national capability uh, in the supply chain for space. Together, these will enable further global partnerships uh, on space missions, as well as a thriving commercial space sector here in the UK. As the strategic importance of space for our economic prosperity grows, so do the risks. We're becoming increasingly reliant on space services. Space applications provide a myriad of services that are used across all aspects of modern life. You might have seen the recent report on the impact on uh, the UK were we to lose uh, GPS uh, systems, uh, approximately 5 billion uh, uh, negative impact in the short term, and I'm sure greater impacts should um, GPS be unavailable for a longer period of time. This dependency also stretches into our national infrastructure, which is critical for the country to function and upon which our daily life depends. Disruption of these services, whether temporarily or over a prolonged period, as I've mentioned, could have serious economic and social impacts. And we need to address and understand these risks and put in place plans to mitigate them. We are embarking on a journey to assess the dependency of the UK's critical national infrastructure on space services. Um, with a particularly big effort in the UK Space Agency where we're putting in place a new team to do this. Our plan is to identify and, where relevant, mitigate the vulnerabilities in space-dependent critical national infrastructure. And the assessment will cover both threats, um, which are intentional, man-made actions such as cyber effects and interference, but also um, natural hazards such as space weather and flooding to ground stations. And this will not be a straightforward or easy task. Working in partnership with industry and influencing internationally, we will work to ensure that these services that are the most critical to everyday life are resilient to disruptive challenge. I think just to pause for a moment, we can reflect on uh, the devastation of Hurricane Irma over the last week and note that space um, is also you know, critical to managing hazards on Earth. Um, I'm sure Chris Lee, who's sitting over there, won't mind my um, praising the work of the International Disaster Charter, which has been particularly uh, important over the last week in getting imagery over the affected area of the Caribbean. So I'd like to say thank you very much to the team there and to Airbus that have been working hard to uh, support those efforts. So I've been clear that there are challenges ahead, but more importantly, I want you to recognise the opportunities. The creation and provision of new satellite services, a clearer regulatory framework that balances safety and enterprise, and most importantly, access to satellite launch capability from UK spaceport, all of these have the potential to change the way the UK economy and the UK government functions. In order to make the most of these opportunities, we will need to foster a change in culture across government where we become better customers as well as better partners, bridging the divide between commercial and institutional civil and security. But if we can change that culture, if we can put space at the heart of our economy and our policy making, I believe that the UK can again lead the way in Europe and in the world. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.